All right, just before I get started, just wanted to confirm on how volume is. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Morning for you. Perfect. Hope you guys are doing well. You know, last week we kind of started on how to approach an actual investment, right? Last week we kind of talked about it from a cost perspective where, you know, we're focusing on how much money it's going to actually cost us to do an investment where we're looking at, you know, cost of a building, cost of the land, cost of things inside the building, cost of renovation and things like that. Now we're going to take it from the other side and where we're going to look at how much money can it make us, right? Because as a potential investor, as a potential homeowner, we look at it from how much it's going to cost us to how much it's going to make us. So depending on which perspective you are, right, you want to utilize all the knowledge that you can gain. So from a cost perspective, we're looking at the upfront, where we're looking at in the moment, how much are we trying to gain backwards, like trying to gain in the future, right? So if it costs us a million dollars, we're trying to find every which way possible to make that million back after we pay the money up front. When we're looking at it from an income perspective, we're looking at since this is, you know, a high cost, how quickly can we get that money back? So it is slightly different. So from an income perspective, we're looking at the way it is right now when we purchase this property, how much can we anticipate to make? And then we start thinking about capitalization, which basically is how do we convert money in the future from upgrades or usage or whatever it may be into now so we're trying to find unique and different ways to make more money from the same actual product right now so we're always forward thinking we're always trying to be creative we're always trying to find everything that is needed so that we can make the most money out of any investment or any property that we own so there's two ways of doing this. We have the direct way, which is a cap rate, which is based on the total cost of the value of the property and how much money we expect to make, right? So that means if we expect to make 3 million on a property that costs 20 million, we would divide 3 million by 20 million to get a cap rate. So the cap rate is always a percentage. It's never a dollar amount or anything like that. It's always a percentage. And then the second way, which is a little bit harder, it's a little bit more steps is where we look at our future cash flows, which is how much money we would expect to make on a flat period, a year, every six months, whatever we're using in that moment. And we discount it at a discount rate. So that's a little bit more complicated. That you know becomes more of a finance time value of money thing. Whereas the easiest one for those who don't want to do that work is they use the direct capitalization, which is just the cap rate, which is if you are reviewing a property, that's the first number that's usually in that property. Um, is the cap rate based upon income and expenses and total cost of the property. So with the cap rate, right, it's usually similar to valuing the stock. Um, for those that invest in stocks, they do a lot of, you know, price earnings, multiples and things like that. And one of the things that we use to get this cap rate is we are going back again to comparable properties where we're looking at properties that are within a short distance of this area that are similar in size, age, availability, and comparing them. 
and we're looking at how, you know based upon their numbers and based upon their usage what was their first year income and we're using that to cap a lot to calculate the cap rate so that we can get a comparable cap rate to all properties so that's util, usually utilizing what we're using here but what we have to be careful of is we have to be careful of relying on others in their capital in their cap rates because sometimes what happens is people don't realize that numbers can be off right human error is a huge thing it happens a lot sometimes we don't pay attention to it sometimes we don't recognize it and we can get a number that's way off and then you know we put that number out to investors and it just leads us down this rabbit hole of trying to correct things and Potentially, if we're selling the property, a deal could go through, or if we're partnering with an investor that's helping us with the money, that money is gone. So we have to make sure that we're thorough. We have to make sure that all of the numbers are correct so that we're giving someone accurate numbers. So that also comes into play when looking at comparable properties, right? So we just have to be very careful in everything that we're doing when it comes to numbers. And if you don't trust your numbers, you know, with you doing it, you should always ask someone else who's more experienced at it, right? Never be afraid to ask for help, but you also want to make sure that they know what they're doing. So all of these things, you just have to make sure that your numbers are right each and every time. Because this is what people utilize to invest in you and invest in the property. And then, you know, for those that invest in, in any type of property, their goal is to get more and more and more, but if they're losing money from just one property, it doesn't really help them that much. Right, so now with using the discounted cash flow method, that's where we project our net cash flows from a standard period of time. Usually people use 10 years and then they discount it based on a required rate of return or you know the appraiser where usually the appraiser uses the internal rate of return which is what we created so this is not you know us um coming up with numbers it's us averaging things out based upon comparables in the market as well as what the property has done before we started even looking to investing it there's a lot of math involved when we are looking at properties and investing in properties and things of that nature so we just have to be aware of what we're looking at when it comes to that right if you know a property is worth four million dollars and it's you know only bringing in a hundred k net every year we have to decide if that's enough net income for us or we can find ways to make it a steal per se buy it low and then create more income right because whenever you're looking at purchasing a property the first thing you want to do is find ways to improve what you already know the company is not making money or there's some improvements that need to be done and then you want to make money back on those improvements right we're always trying to gain more we're trying to not necessarily drain the building with every dollar but just make more money and more use out of the property that we have we want what we call the highest and best use having used that in a couple of weeks but in every property that is exactly what we're looking for we want the highest and best use, which means how much money can this property bring us? And does it look the nicest, right? That's, you know, everything ranging from landscaping in the front yard to are the stairs, you know, safe enough? If, you know, we have customers that are handicapped, is there a, you know, a pathway for them to get up? Is there an elevator in the building? Is there one floor, two floors, right? If it's an office building, is there security, right? All of these things, these are all important for us. We're trying to make the highest and best use 
gain more customers, which makes more money for us. That's what we should always be thinking about. So the discount cash flows method, like I said in the beginning, is a little bit more intense for those that love numbers, for those that really want to dig deep into just avoiding just cap rate, because like I said, cap rate for most is sufficient. For a lot of people, it's really not, just because people can have a couple good years, but the 10 years before the property, when it first existed, was terrible. So you have so many what ifs when it comes to just finding a, a cap rate method that most people want to dig deeper, do a little bit more research to get towards the discounted cash flows because it's it has a lot of things that they estimate first off they are estimating a buyer's expected holding period how long are you going to keep this property right if you're keeping the property how long are you going to use it to the, its current use or make it more efficient and go to its highest and best use how long is that going to take you what are you estimating that the property is going to make from you know, these next holding next 10 years, if that's how long you're going to hold it for, as well as how much you're going to expect to make from the sale of the property. So even if you decide you're never going to sell this property, you still need to have a way to determine how much this property is going to be worth in 5, 10, 15 years if you eventually do decide to sell, right? With most owners and investors they can say that they don't decide you know that they won't decide to sell a property but there's always a number that will make someone change their mind always right it doesn't matter what it is what that number may be for that property there's always a number in the back of a person's mind that be like hey that could be something that I could part with this thing for. So just think of that in the back of your mind right? as an investor, as an owner. Because that means you'd be able to pay everything off. Your improvements have been you know, here and that averages out with the net income that you expect to make. So all of these things are potential things to think about. Right. So this is how we actually calculate our net operating income, right? And this is for an actual office building. Now, if we're doing this for a single family home, these numbers are a little bit different, right? Home, you know, as an investor buying individual homes or properties is different than buying like a lot um, large buildings that have large amount of tenants. Large amount of tenants you have what we call vacancy collection loss. So that is people, you know, having part of the building where no one's renting it out or, you know, people have been behind for so long that you just kick them out. So you don't know if you're actually going to gain that rent back. So that takes into a negative because you don't know. Yeah, miscellaneous income, that could be from, you know, if you own a large apartment building, you might have, you know, people losing keys, so you charge them to make to make a new key. Laundry, parking, right? Those types of things. Then you have your operating expenses, which are basic things you need to run the business. Salaries, building maintenance, all those types of things. And then your capital expenditures. So this is how you calculate NOI or net operating income, right? So it's not that, you know, we don't know how much a building is going to cost us. We just don't know based upon when we take ownership, one, what's expected of us, and two, who and what's going to be there once we take ownership, right? You can have places that are trash just because people decide that they don't, they didn't like, you know, previous ownership, so they'll break things or anything of that nature, right? They may also potentially leave a bunch of, you know, old things that they don't want anymore. So they left it there. So you have to clean it up or you have to fix windows 
it, there's a variety of all of these different things that you don't know or can't prepare for. That's why you have to have money on hand to make basic updates or if you want to update things to the way that you want it, have that money available, right? Because if you make improvements, income goes up, demand goes up because it looks nice from the outside. All of these unique and different things that you can do for this property, you have to be prepared to do, right? The, the nicer the property looks, the more money it's going to make when you are purchasing because there's not much for you to do as far as improvements. If there are things that you can tell need to be, you know, updated and things like that, that's where you need more money on hand or you can slowly start fixing those things. But these are things that you have to be aware of. Right? So if you have a large building, like I said, apartment building or commercial building, your main source of income is rental, right? In a commercial building, you are more likely to have tenants that pay a couple years up front, right? In residential rent, you know, rental, they pay first their first month and then security deposit, right? So most people go with a commercial building because they'll pay a couple years up front. They're responsible for their own insurance, their own utilities. The only thing you're giving them is the space. In rental, for residential, they give you the first and security deposit. But you, as the owner, are responsible for improvements. You're responsible to have utilities set up, and then they pay for it every month. You're responsible for anything that goes wrong. They're just supposed, most residential people just assume that they can come in and pay their rent every month. Right. Now, in commercial, you can do a, ver a very type of lease. You can do straight, which is, you know, they'll pay a couple years up front, but the price never changes. Right. You can have a step up where after a certain period of time, the rent goes up, but you also have to make sure that that's in writing and agreed upon. You can't just decide to utilize it because you will usually lose a tenant. That's, you know, something to keep in mind, right? We want to keep our tenants for years upon years because that's guaranteed income for us. So we have to make sure that we're doing right by them as well, right? Then we have index where the rent is going up based upon inflation. Most renters aren't going to want to do that because if they realize that right now inflation is really high, which means their rent is high. And then you also have percentage where the rent is included with a percentage of the tenant sales average based upon a certain time period. So if you really wanted to do that, that would be a little bit hard because the rent could fluctuate again. So if I were you guys, most people usually do a straight level with, after a certain period of time, a step up, right? But the majority of people just usually utilize a straight lease. Flat payments doesn't change. Right. We were, you know, some write a new contract every year and then we go from there. The apartment leases now are very varied. Usually they are a step up, which means that after a year, they naturally rise depending on where you're living because they take into cost of living, they take into, right, and the rent may go up 50, 100 bucks. But you have to determine how that figures for you, but that's a natural thing that just happens. Right, so here's an example of an office building. All right, eight office suites. They have two at 1800, one at 3600, and five at 1560. In their contracts, they have a natural rent increase of 3%, and they have 
10% losses every year, people are going to move. People are going to leave. Commercial, that's just how it is, right? Then there's their operating expenses, their capital expenditures, and they expect to hold having this property for five years, right? Naturally, we always expect for leases to expire during any time we own a property. People are going to leave. People are going to renew. People are going to make changes consistently all the time. We just have to be ready for it. So we naturally, to help us, we look at our potential gross income. If every unit is rented, how much money would we make every month? They pay on time. That's a natural assumption here, right? So we take what all of those monthly figures, we add them up, and then we multiply by 12. That's how much we expect to make every year if it's 100% occupied, which means that nobody has their lease expire or they still renew within the time frame of this year. Right? So that's how we gain our potential gross income. So this is our potential gross income for the year. All right. Like I said, each one times 12, add them all together. It's 180,000. Right. So what people usually look at if you're looking for a commercial space is the monthly rent and the price per square foot. Right. So most people would, you know, Average about one to two dollars per square foot, which is very fair, right? So they always compare the value of the lease of this property to the market. We do that for everything. We compare the price per square foot and the rent per month. So that's how we determine how smart of an investment, how smart of a lease, how great is this lease compared to anything else. Right. So we saw that there was a actual vacancy and collection loss, right? 5%. So example, like I said, our miscellaneous income garage and rentals, parking fees, laundry, vending machines, anything that is placed in the property that they need or can utilize to enhance their, you know, their framework of their business, right? What do I have inside that makes or draws other people in, right? Do I have, you know, underground parking do i have valet right laundry and apartment building that's crucial vending machines i need a snack late at night i don't feel like going to the store can i run to the lobby and grab chips and a soda right all of these things are important even though they're small they are important to anyone and people make decisions based on these if they're going to rent to the place or not. So we take out that vacancy loss, and this is their effective gross income. Right. So in our operating expenses, we define these as normal, regular expenditures that you will see consistently that keeps a property running as if you know normally efficient as it can and what i mean by that those are usually you know property taxes for building hazard insurance maintenance maintenance is variable because you could have no issues and all of a sudden a water burst a water pipe burst the gas doesn't start working again a laundry machine just stops functioning it needs to be replaced Right, so we know exactly what is fixed and we know exactly what is variable. Supplies are always variable. You never know what changes, you, right? Inflation on its own in the consumer price index is completely different than what it is for just fixing something, right? You have people that 
you know, utilize different things and have different fees. So we have all of these variables that we have to keep into account, be mindful of, and utilize to our advantage, right? So we are looking at our operating expenses. We don't put anything in as capital expenditures. We don't use depreciation. We don't use mortgage. Mortgage is its own category. So what we pay on the property, that's its own complete category. That's not in our capital expenditures. We have to make sure we do that because that throws off our whole accounting. Because in our expenses, we have categories that are broken down for things that we use naturally on a daily, monthly, quarterly, yearly basis. Right, and our capital expenditures are non-recurring things that we pay for that increase the value of the property and extend what we call its useful life. So this is a term that we really haven't gotten to use yet. And it basically means the useful value is how long can you have a property running at the way that you want it to run with its original intended purpose, right? When you buy an apartment building, right? I'm buying an apartment building so that I can rent it out to tenants so that we can make consistent monthly income. Now making consistent monthly income, that's our purpose. That's its intended useful life. How long can I keep that up? Now things start breaking down, right? I'm jeopardizing the useful life. Even though I'm updating it, its current use, right? If our vacancy rates are 100%, there's bound to be vacancies as we're updating, right? If I'm replacing a roof, if I'm adding a pool, if I'm replacing the HVAC system, right? Or if I'm just resurfacing parking, that doesn't really affect useful life. But if I'm doing something inside of the property where people are actually running out that can affect the useful life right everything we should be doing should be stretching it out right we should be extending how long this product is useful for us before we sell it when we sell it we want to make sure that we got as much of the useful life out of it or because of our updates and because of our maintenance people want to pay more for it so you get to choose how long you keep this property for. But when you keep it, you either sell it because there's no use for it, it's too expensive for you to maintain, or you've maximized its function and you want to take advantage of getting more profit from it. So that's what you have to look for. Right. How do I want this to work for me? Right. I don't want to spend too much money on the property and not get that money back, right? Because as an investor, all of these capital expenditures that you're doing is an investment in the future for when you sell this property or you keep it and you can justify raising rent or charging a fee for parking every month, right? All of these things, this is what justifies it. Proof is in the capital expenditures. Right, the return is not immediate, but it's always intended for the future. And then this is just a formula again. Right, now our net operating income, that is a property's dividend. Right. So the dividend is money you are getting back because you own something. Now, it's not an investor's dividend because naturally you have to, as an investor, you're distributing money in other places, right? This is just what you get, and then you can use it for whatever you want, right? The projected stream of net operating income 
is what we use to determine the value of the company or the product or the building, right? This number affects so much, right? And this number allows any type of investor to see if this is an acceptable amount of money that they're getting on their return. You have to be careful of net operating investment, right? Versus our net cash flows. They're two completely separate different things. So you have to keep that in mind. Calculations are similar, but both numbers are used for completely different things. All right, so this is how you calculate that valuation. All right, that net operating income over the selling price when we do decide to sell. And this is our cap rate. So the cap rate, this is as a decimal, right? Just remember that you multiply by 100 to get the percent. So the cap rate is about 8.4. 8.4 for California is really good. For other places, it might be average. California is really, really kind of low as far as cap rate right now because of the cost of everything. All right, so now they've calculated based upon that fresh year net operating income right what is the value so they multiply the cap you know the noi divided by the cap rate all right so estimated market value is a little bit over 1.06 million Right, so anytime you want to determine the cap rate, you just go NOI divided by sales price. And then if you want to check out the cap rate, you go NOI divided by cap rate, and the number should be the same. So, when you are trying to look at a cap rate, right? Here, what they're doing in their calculating this first year return is they're looking at how much it's selling at the end of the year compared to the value plus the cap rate. So that's what we call an appreciation, right? This is the natural profit that you're gaining from the sale, the 1.077, because they decide to sell it after a year because they want to take advantage of the market. So their first year return ends up being the cap rate plus that appreciation rate because it's sold for higher than the value. So someone saw a full value in this, right? So our gross income multiplier is the sales price divided by effective gross income. It determines value for the rental properties. There's no operating expense info needed. It doesn't matter, right? We don't need that. Things to assume. Market rates are paid on time and up to date. And that the operating expense percentage is pretty much close to the same or the same around all projects, like all properties, and the same property that we own. So the best way to you know to utilize this is with properties that have short-term leases so our apartments our rental houses our you know warehouses that only run on year contracts all of these things are important all right just another way of doing that again so one of the things i want you guys to be aware of is not only are the good things about it but the bad things about it like I said, sometimes what you have is you can have in, inadequate information on the comparables or the comps, as we call it, because market rates could go up, they could go down. That price that it was 
paid for could be different, right? You could be expecting an increase in rents, which leads to a higher value so that the cap rate hits where it needs to be, right? All of these things are potential for happening when we're looking at comparables. Every situation is different for them. You could also have the fact that there's not enough comparables, right? Most people try to go within, for commercial, it usually ends up being like a five mile radius, just because depending on the area that you're in, there may not be a lot of properties for sale. And then you also have to look at how the market was, right? You can't really determine inflation at that moment. You have to do a lot of work if another property hasn't sold similar to yours within the last two, one to two years, right? Commercial in this pandemic has been greatly affected by a lot of different things. One of those things is availability, right? Purchasing a building that's been abandoned or whatever and taking the time to update it. We don't even know if we want to use it for the way it was originally intended to be used. We don't know if we're going to, you know, change and update it. You never know. Right. And then you also have a few years back in a lot of rental contracts, there was a natural escalation. So which means after a certain period of time, the rent don't go up and it was just naturally assumed by the tenant there was no arguing there was no you know justification needed it was just agreed upon it just happened we don't do that now so you also have to take that into into mind as well right so again, just to sum up all of that, we have the potential for inadequate data because of varying prices on the market lease, rent escalations, length of leases, and there isn't an exact way on how the money's being distributed for operating expenses. So sometimes they may just wanna use the, the cash flow, right? So with the cash flow, we're taking all the numbers that we did to find our net operating income and comparing them together. All right, and then using that with the cap rate that we found to figure out the value. Right, as we see our NOI is expected to change, it's never the same. It's almost com it's almost impossible for it to be the same numbers over and over. So we just have to be aware of the varying trend of our actual cash flow. Are we going up? Are we going down? Are we kind of staying the same in the same range? Because that's important. Because if we're in the same range usually every year, that means it's easier for us to find small things to tweak to increase our NOI, right? We can find different ways to make things happen. All right. So is there a specific way that is better to, you know, to finding the value of a property? to invest in, right? Is it fewer deliberate instructions, right? Are there a lot of assumptions? What assumptions are we naturally making? What's important to us, right? Do we really want to take the time to work with appraisers? Are they too busy? You know, maybe they're not good with numbers. There's all of these different factors that we're dealing with. We just have to understand for us. And I'm not saying for everyone. For us as investors, just saying us as a core in general. 
what is important to us? What matters the most? What is easy for me to understand when it comes to fulfilling my goals as a purchaser of a property? All right. What am I trying to get out of it? Price, all those types of things. That's all important. So knowing that and understanding how to calculate that leaves us at a position where we can make smart decisions that will only positively affect our careers and our futures as investors. All right. Any questions on anything I just went over? No questions. All right. So let's do this. Let's take a 15 minute break. And then I will get started on parts of chapter nine. And then we will end after that. So everyone comes back at 11. And then I will get started on chapter nine.
Yeah, but you have to. How do you stay in the phone? I I All right, so now after we've looked at the actual ways of investing and why we invest, now we're getting into the meat of it, which is how to pay for it, contracts, and laws. So laws and contracts, no matter where you go, are going to be the longest discussion that you will have in real estate, as well as the money, right? We have to figure out how we actually pay for the, these investments that we want as a company or as an individual so the most common one is the mortgage right with the creation of a mortgage more people can own their own home right businesses can use cash for core activities investors can leverage and diversify and homeowners can obtain credit with better terms than just you know looking at it from a what we call consumer, which is just using credit score to get a smaller amount of money. So, you know, a mortgage has a lower interest rate than our lines of credit or home equity. They're better for taxes, right? We have a lot of things that are available and have access to 
because of the creation of mortgages. So for us, we want to utilize that to our full advantage, right? We want to make sure that that is consistently available to us as much as possible. So we have to make sure that we get all accurate information from ourselves, from, you know, our business dealings so that we can get the accurate amount of info so that we can have the right mortgage. Right? Plain and simple. So we're going to focus on what is a mortgage, what happens when it's in trouble, different introduction to creative ways of financing, and what laws are actually in charge of home lending. Or business lending. So in our mortgage, we have two things that we're worried about. The exact terms of the obligation, one. Two is the mortgage or what we call the deed of trust for other people, which is if I mess up on paying these things, right, through the mortgage, the property I am naturally putting up to replace that, right? So if I mess this up, right, if I, you know, fall behind or anything like that, the property automatically goes back to the person who gave us the mortgage, which is usually a bank, a credit union, or a mortgage lender. So we have to know exactly who we pay when these things go awry. So the note itself is two possible ways most people use fixed so that they can expect to pay the same amount of money each month very rarely do people do adjustable the fixed rate is a monthly charge that is one twelfth of the annual rate because there's 12 months in a year and then many properties have 30 year mortgages so you're paying interest for 360 months the daily rate is 1360 if of the actual year right they don't go off of a a 365 day year they go off a 360 day year the adjustable is based upon an index which usually is the maturity rate of the treasury or the home mortgage rate index. So these are things to be vastly aware of. Right? So our adjustable rate, right? You start looking at what the lender is marking up, which usually includes their commission payout as well as their fees. Um, a change date. So you know an adjustable rate each time that your rate is going to change. And then you have the initial rate, which is what we call the teaser, because it's reduced naturally before the lender and the market comes in and ups your rate, right? So you can see why you could be paying way more than what you normally would expect to pay because it's adjustable. So most people do not even consider using an adjustable rate. They rather stick with the fixed you know, sometimes they rather go shorter instead of 30 to go 15, right? So it cuts down the amount of interest you're paying, even though the rate might be higher. That just means that more is going to the principal, which is what we want. The lower the principal, the faster we pay off the property. Right. So our adjustable rate, it could be periodic, it could be lifetime. There are some that do have payment caps, so it limits how many payments you can make or changes in the payments compared to the interest rate changes, right? And then if you don't pay the interest, it automatically goes into the balance that pays off once you either sell the property or even pay it off, right? So payments are always due at the end of the month naturally always 30 days just because since our our 360 day you know calendar year in this you divide by 12 it's every 30 days right so we could have a fixed rate 
with a level payment, same every time, or partially amortized where we could be making a balloon payment, which is a large payment, either once a year or at the end of the whole contract, right? So all of these things, you know, when we're looking at our mortgage, we just want to find the best way possible for our mortgage, right? As a home buyer, what's the best way for us to do this? Fixed periodic changes, increases most likely in our interest rate, amortization, what is the easiest way for us to do this? What do we want? What do we prefer? So that's up to us. And then also based upon the info, what is the mortgage lender or bank or whatever willing to give us? So this is how interest is on a level. At the beginning, you're going to be paying a bulk of interest, not much on the principal, but as the years go on, you start paying more and more on the principal, then it gets 50-50, and then it becomes mainly just the principal. Now, on just a heads up on paying on the on that side, if you go shorter, like I said, you're paying less interest. So after that, the switch from bulk loan, you know, paying majority interest is faster comparing to a 30 year. And then, so the note when it comes to right of re prepayment, right? Usually there's no right of prepayment. You can pay as much as you want, you can pay as much as possible. Right, you can make payments two or three times a month or whatever it may be. Right, naturally, you have a right to repay the property off faster. You know, there's no penalty or anything of that nature unless it specifically states that you can't pay it off earlier than expected. Right. Now, if you here in the United States, if you go through the military loan program and the government backed loan program, there are potential opportunities for you to face a small fine if you pay early, but have the actual you know possibility of having a line of credit to make any changes or anything like that. Right, so other terms of the loan, non-recourse, which means there's no personal liability. They can demand immediate prepayment, who is they as in the lender, and then they can create actual mortgage clauses by reference, but that is also up to them. So some terms to know in a mortgage. First off, the mortgager is the person borrowing. The mortgagee is the lender that's giving the mortgage, right? If most people think of the mortgage as a temporary transfer of title, which means title is the ownership, right? If you remember from the first couple of weeks, is the legal document that proves ownership of the property. So in a mortgage situation, the mortgager, it, the mortgagee is the owner until you, the mortgager, pays off the property and it naturally switches to you as the owner of the property. Right. So originally, for now, the mortgagee is the owner. And then you pay it off and you, the mortgager, becomes the owner. And then one of the things to remember when you are actually doing your mortgage is you want to make sure that the right description of the property is there. Right? That's important. Insurance, escrow, acceleration, everything that deals with the property, you want to make sure that that is correct. That is important.
right? So the difference between a mortgage and a deed of trust is the mortgage is, is directly between you and the lender. The deed of trust is a third party, which is the trustee, is in between the dealings. So you can do either way. You just want to do which one is best. Right. So the bad thing that happens with a mortgage is it goes into default, which means that you either miss payments or you violated terms. Right. Neither one of these are things that we actually want to do. So we just have to be aware of that. Right. So the way to fix a default is counseling, reorganization of the debt, reduction of payments. You can sell the property in an assisted sale or a short sale. Right. So a deed in lieu of a foreclosure, right? You know, you don't want to get to this point. These are things that are very, very um, kind of dangerous to do, per se. Like, you don't really want to actually do that, right? You want to, you know, these are things that you don't want to actually you know, have happened to you, right? These are very extreme. They are just, this is the actual worst case scenario that you don't want to have happen to you. Um, but there are options, right, to avoid the foreclosure. You could go into bankruptcy, which nullifies and wipes out the mortgage, but bankruptcy stays on your credit here for at least seven years. So we don't want to ever extremely get to this point, but we have to be aware that these things do happen. Right, so foreclosure is the legal process of terminating all claims of ownership and all liens. So, you know, a negative to it is, you know, the potential of not notifying someone that you're foreclosing on the property. It's a long time to actually get done, distressed, right? And there's lien priority, which starts with those that own, you know, whoever I owe. There's a natural order of how I pay off those debts, right? And it's a long time to get back from a foreclosure. So one of the things that we're expecting this um, market to create just because of high prices and things like that. So it's going to be a lot of situations that people don't really want to deal with. Right. So we have to understand whose priority, what gets paid off first. And if there's still money left over, that's my responsibility to pay. So these are things that we have to be aware of at the end of the day is. Who do we owe? Who gets paid off first when we sell? And is there is anything left after we sell? Where are that? Right. So in a foreclosure, a lot of these things, you know, go to courts and the court helps determine or facilitates these sales so that everyone knows who gets paid out first once this property is done. Right. And these are the states that actually allow for a power of sale. Right. And as a as a you know consumer, you have three possible ways to file bankruptcy. Right? Chapter seven, which is just a pure liquidation, chapter eleven, which is the court. And chapter 13, which is the one that affects actual wage earnings, right? A mortgage loan doesn't completely wipe out a mortgage lien on a bankruptcy, but it helps. 
11 and 13 have delays. So if you do chapter seven, which is where you're just liquidating everything you own to pay towards things that you owe, it makes life easier. Right, so you can, the, there's a potential of acquiring property with existing debt, right? Where you have it subject to, right? There's no personal liability. The property is still in charge of everything, right? So if we're assuming ownership, the buyer signs a signature to that, there's a personal liability, right? And then if you have debt without a mortgage, right, you zoom in on that. There's a couple steps and there's things that we don't have to worry about. So just some things for you to keep in mind. You don't ever want to get to this point, but there are things that are there that allow us to learn about this, right? So the laws here that actually directly go towards lending or the equal equal credit opportunity act which doesn't discriminate based upon you know age gender religion ethnicity those types of things federal truth and lending which makes sure that you have all information needed respa which is the settlement procedures right no matter where you are you can own property in this area that's important as well then you have these other Right. And then the Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act, which is protects, you know, those that can't prove income from, you know, potentially like those that are in some negative activity. You have to be able to prove income to purchase a home. Right. Any questions on those guys? Any questions on anything we went over today? So what we'll do is we will stop here for today. Um, I will go deeper into the laws tomorrow and then we'll start getting into contracts. These next couple of weeks are gonna be very important because the contracts is exactly what sets everything up. You have to know your contracts to be prepared for anything. So if you don't know the contracts, you can't be prepared. So we'll stop here. You guys have a great week and I'll see you next Monday. Thank you, you too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.